Good morning and a very warm welcome to the eighth meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2019. I remind everyone present to please turn mobile phones to silent so that they don't disrupt the meeting. Uh, apologies have been received this morning from my colleague Gordon MacDonald, MSP. Our first agenda item is a decision on whether to take agenda item three in private and we also need to decide whether to take consideration of a draft report on Scottish national standardised assessments and the committee's consideration of the approach to subject choices inquiry in the next meeting in private. Uh, are members content to take agenda item three in private yes. and to take the future consideration of the draft report in private? Okay. Thank you. Uh, agenda item two, um, we're continuing our evidence session on additional support needs and um, following from our 2017 report on additional support needs. And the panel of witnesses from organisations and practitioner representatives who work directly with children and young people with additional support needs have joined us today. Can I welcome Kayleigh Thorpe, Head of Campaigns and Policy and Activism at Enable. Nick Ward, the Director of National Autistic Society Scotland. Seamus Searson, General Secretary of Scottish Secondary Scottish Secondary Teachers Association, which I think will say SSTA <laughs> for the duration of the uh, committee this morning. Uh, if the panel would like to respond to a question, please indicate to myself or the clerks and we'll try and ensure that you get a, an opportunity to respond. And can I begin by inviting a brief outline of their work and their organisation's experience in the area, including any work that's been done since their report in 2017. Can I invite uh, Kelly Thorpe to begin with that. Thanks. Um, thank you. It's great to be here today. Um, I've spoken at the, the committee before on this subject, so delighted to be back. Um, just over two years ago, in December 2016, Enable Scotland published Included in the Main. Included in the Main was really about recognising that Scottish education has come a long way. Um, and 16 years ago at that time, um, from, we took a very progressive step um, towards the enshrinement of the UNCRPD Article 24. The presumption to mainstream has achieved um, the majority of young people being educated alongside their peers in a mainstream setting, but including the main set out to listen to that generation and learn from their experiences and inform what should be the next steps on the journey to inclusion, because that's what we should be striving for. Um, inclusion beyond mainstreaming, beyond the right to be present, is the right to be included. Um, and that, that is, that's what I'd like to speak to the panel about today. Um, and I really welcome the committee's ongoing interest in this subject. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr Ward? Thanks. Thank you. Um, I represent both the National Autistic Society, but also our partner Scottish Autism and Children in Scotland. And since the publication of um, this committee's report, we have published our own report called Not Included, not engaged, not involved. Um, to give a bit of context to that, we wanted to provide, to get a deeper understanding of families with autistic children where those children were missing school and what that experience looked like. We surveyed 1,400 parents and carers of autistic children who had been out of school in the last two years. And what we discovered is what you'd expect, that autistic um, families are facing incredible barriers to accessing support um, and accessing education, which they're entitled to. But it also included um, a number of key findings that did shock us, um, particularly that more than a third said that their child had been unlawfully excluded. So that was the, the, that's the idea that the correct processes were not followed when their child was sent home. Um, often this child was sent home against the will of the parents. And as such, that child didn't get the proper support when reintegrating back into school. Um, we also discovered that a quarter of these people were saying this was happening more than once a week, so they were regularly getting phone calls demanding that they turn up to their school um, and take their child home. And um, the key part of that was, was also that 200 of those parents said that they'd had to either give up or seriously reduce their working hours in order to cope and deal with the situation that their school couldn't cope and support their children. Um, which was really significant. We published a report and we've had um, significant engagement from the Scottish Government um, on it, which we're very grateful for. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions on the report um, during this and to talk a little bit about the experience of autistic children and their families within the school system. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr Searson. Uh, good morning. Uh, the Se Scottish Secondary Teachers Association represents just under 7,000 teachers in secondary schools. 
um, and we submitted a report back in 2017, which you've, you've already seen. Uh, if anything, the situation has got worse in terms of the number of pupils that have identified with ASN has increased, and the number of staff, including teachers and support staff, has been reducing. Uh, and unfortunately, the, the consequence of that is that most children's needs are not being met. Uh, there's a greater disruption in classes, which obviously blends into other issues as well, um, and a greater burden on the, the classroom teacher. And as a teacher's association, that's one of the things that we're very concerned about. As you probably appreciate, there is a, a major campaign on teachers' pay going on at the moment, but sh uh, follow following shortly behind that is obviously workload, which is obviously uh, escalated as a consequence of this, uh, and the, sh the short shortage of resources in ASN across uh, our schools in Scotland is inconsistent, uh, but equally uh, people seem to think uh, a lack of understanding of what ASN actually is, and I think that's one of the things I'd like to get across today during today's meeting. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to move to questions from the committee and move to Mr Gray. Thanks, uh, convener. And um, uh, last, last week um, uh, in the discussion that we had with the panel, we spent uh, some time on the um, decline in the use of coordinated support plans. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there was some concern expressed by the panel last week because the CSP is the plan which has a statutory basis. Uh, and it's the gateway as well to access to the tribunal service. And I really just wanted to ask the panel for their views on uh, the very low level of application of the CSP process. Um, so I don't, have, I don't have any data on it, but what I do know is that we had our cross-party group on autism um, two weeks ago, and it was one of the issues that was brought up by the audience there as something that people were really struggling with, with the level of inconsistency that they were experiencing from different local authorities. And there felt, there, the room seemed to indicate that they felt that there should be greater and stronger guidance on the application of CSPs and on people understanding their right to have one and to ask for one, and that that information wasn't always clear um, to families who are often struggling with lots of different things at once. So I think the main thing that sort of stood out there was the, the lack of consistency in approaches from different places. I would, I, would, I would agree and I would, I would echo some of the, the evidence that you probably heard last, last week as well. Um, there, there is a decline and you, you have the data on that. Um, I think what we see in terms of parents and families is what you heard about last week, the, the, the fight and the struggle for what, what their support, the support needs for their child and the CSP is seen as, as a mechanism for, for addressing that. Um, so a lot of families would like to have one, but again, there are a lot of families that, that don't know that they exist. Um, so, yes, I would agree that a, a lot of the work could be done to, to raise awareness of the, the right to, to access the CSP um, and that understanding across the whole education system from parents, families, teachers, local authorities. Um, we, we know that the, the child's plan is also something that um, is seen as a as a, another mechanism for planning, but it, what I would say is that it doesn't have the statutory enforcement that comes with a, a, a CSP, which is what you, you will have heard from previous witnesses and, and again provides that gateway to the tribunal. Um, so, yeah, more more awareness and understanding of rights is, is crucial for, for supporting families and supporting young people. So, so if you think that um, there's a lack of understanding or awareness mm -hmm. amongst families that they do have a statutory right to CSP. Uh, whose fault do you think that is? I mean, you're, you're, you're both, Nick and Kelly, you're both uh, work for organisations who are advocates for those families. Is it, is it your failure to, to let them know that they have these statutory rights or is it, I don't know, the council's? Whose failure is it then? So, uh, <laughs> I, I would hold our hand up actually and say that we do have a responsibility as an organisation that advocates for people and that maybe we need to go and think for ourselves a little bit about how we can make that information clearer on our resources. But ultimately the failure for that has to rest with the, with, I would argue with the Scottish Government um, and I would say it has to rest with the idea that if you are someone who is either disabled or a disabled person in your family, um, there is lots of examples of different bits of information that you struggle to get and to put together. And that doesn't just happen with just one area, that happens across the board. And I think that it's something that 
I, I, again, I would say both national government and local authorities both have a responsibility too. I don't know whose fault it is, but I think we all have a bit of responsibility and we all need to sort of step up to that a bit. I was, I was just going to say before was that uh, it's uh, just to give a, a flavour of how big this thing has, has changed. I mean, the number of children with ASN has increased nearly uh, uh, doubled since 2011, nearly 200,000 youngsters. Yet the number of uh, CSPs has dropped by nearly, you know, by half. Uh, but those children haven't disappeared. Um, and I think there's one of the major failings in the system is that we shouldn't be uh, expecting parents to know what their rights are. The system should be de delivering what's best for those youngsters in our schools. And I think it's a, it's a failing of the system, and I'm going to say the government, the local authorities, and the schools themselves. The lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, because all teachers want to do the best for their youngsters, but they haven't got the tools to do so. And I feel we need to be looking at it a slightly different way. Those parents that are able to access uh, and understand the rights is one group, but there's a vast number that don't. And I think there's a failing there. If, if we really are serious about inclusion in schools and doing the best for all our children, then we need to change the whole approach. And that's not an easy give, but I, I do understand. So, so when you ask the question where we need to do, we need to be focusing on it should be the authorities, the system's right to make sure that those children meet get their, their needs, uh, because at the moment they've been failed. Uh, and I will, I'd, I'd say that more than a, a time because that's the message I'm getting from our teachers in schools who cannot cope at the moment. And most of it is they don't understand the system. Every authority has got a different system, a different interpretation. And what's expected of teachers is different. Uh, so I think we've got a whole major education process to, to undertake to try and get this thing uh, to actually do what we want to do. But teachers are part of that system, mm. system Mr Searson. So mm. do you think they're aware that um, those children have a statutory right to CSP? Are they saying to their school, why does this pupil in my class not have a CSP? The teachers themselves don't understand. And that's an easy, uh, I'll give a go so far as teachers can very easily identify that there's a, a, a youngster has got some extra needs, but they're not experts and know how to do that. Uh, and I, I feel that we've got to be able to change that environment. You hear often talked about we, we need to do more in initial teacher education to make people aware of all these different things. It's impossible to deliver all of that in, in this initial teacher education. And I think we've got to expect that the, there needs to be experts working in our schools who can identify those youngsters and help the teachers to deliver what they need to do. Teachers aren't experts in all these fields, and we've got to accept that. In your submission, uh, SST, SSTA say the child plans were introduced around 2011. These will eventually replace individualised education programmes and coordinated support plans. Um, so, so that kind of jumped out to me because the evidence we, we heard from the Ombudsman last week was only the CSP has a statutory right associated with it. Um, it is the practice that you're experiencing, that you, you, your members are experiencing, is that they, they are being phased out by practice rather than an understanding? In many cases, the teachers don't understand that they're there. That what they are often given is a different label on a, on a process that's, which is internal. Uh, just to give some examples, a wellbeing assessment plan, a coordinated service plan, get it right for me plan. These are just some examples of what are going around the authorities. And because when the youngsters move authorities or teachers move authorities, it's a different process. They're all very bureaucratic, um, and I would argue that the reason they're bureaucratic is uh, to actually try and, and push the numbers back to reduce them. Uh, because teachers get frustrated because they say there's a need for a youngster and by the time they've completed one set of forms, they find there's another set of forms and then they have to do another update. So it, 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 the system is bogged down with bureaucracy and not in the interest of the young people. Okay, thank you. Ms Thorpe, did you want to come back in? It, it was just, it was, it was really to, to kind of restate some of the points that were made, but we, we do need a proactive system for families and for young people, and I think that's, that's to, to Seamus's point. W most common phrases that we hear from families are lack of information, battle, stressful, alone. So we need a proactive system that, that is telling them about what support is available to them and to their, to their young person. Okay, Mr Gray, you... Um, can I move to Ms. Smith? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, obviously, the, the Parliament uh, debated the issue of mainstreaming uh, a month ago. 
and uh, unanimously we agreed that mainstreaming in principle is a good thing and I don't think anybody wants to remove that. Uh, nonetheless, the Parliament also agrees that there are concerns about the increasing number, just as Mr Searson has been spelling out, the increasing number um, and being reported uh, by teachers who um, are not coping particularly well in mainstream education. And whether you feel that the guidance that is given to local authorities is adequate, whether it needs to be extended or, re or, or reformed, um, because the Cabinet Secretary has helpfully given a commitment that he will look at these again. Could you give us your views on that? Um, so uh, the guidance on the presumption to mainstream was, was the, the, the primary call from Enable Scotland's, including the main campaign in 2016. We believe that we, schools and local authorities did need more guidance because that was, that was guidance written two two, in 2000. It's, 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 we've come a long way since then. We've got GERFEC. We have a, a huge number of, of developments since then, including the Additional Support for Learning Act. Um, so yes, we, we do believe that it needs to be reformed and that schools need to, to schools and local authorities need more guidance on going beyond the right to be present, which I think is what is delivered at the moment, mm. to the right to be included and in what that looks and feels like. Um, we have been part of um, contributing our thoughts and views to, to a review of guidance, so um, we, we look forward to, to that being published. Can, can I just press you a little bit on, on that issue? I mean, do you feel that, that there are three conditions, obviously, um, which, uh, if they are met, allows a child to go into a special school situation? Do you feel that these uh, three conditions need to be expanded or changed? Um, is there something specific you're looking for in, in better guidance? So um, I, I believe it would be need to be a change in the law in terms of those those three specific conditions. Um, I, I don't think that we need to go beyond those conditions. I think what we need to encourage is the thinking that goes into the, the application of those exceptions. And I believe what the guidance seeks to address is some of the, the, the kind of probing questions that need to be considered to, in, the, in the application of each of those um, conditions. So just to be clear, it's about the interpretation, is it? of these conditions, you don't want the actual conditions yeah. to change? The interpretation and then beyond that, the implementation. So what does it look and feel like when you are in a mainstream setting? And okay. I think that's the, that's the biggest condition for me. Uh, Mr. Searson, can I just ask about what feedback you've had from uh, teachers, your teaching uh, union on this issue? I think we, we, we do need more guidance and, I would, uh, and more practical guidance as well because it's very vague uh, and it's down to the interpretation of the local authorities. And many of the local authorities, due to the cuts over the years, haven't got the expertise there anymore. Uh, and therefore, it's often left on the doorstep of the, of the school to try and interpret. And again, the expertise isn't there inside the schools either, because with the sort of uh, uh, changes in schools that have taken place, the more drive, especially in the secondary sector, towards qualifications, uh, things like ASN are, are the poor relation in the school. Uh, and I would go even so far as that if you looked into many of the, the secondary schools, uh, that in diff the, the teacher that's responsible for ASN may do a completely different job in one authority than they do in, a different, in another authority. They may be responsible for pupil behaviour, guidance, pastoral. They're all mixed up. And I think in some authorities, guidance teachers are doing ASN work. So I think there needs to be some clarity of who these people are. But going back to the issue of our inclusion, is that if the youngsters are going to come in, they need to have all the support to give them a chance. And that's what's lacking. And if there is support, it tends to be only in, a, in some subjects. So it doesn't, it doesn't go across the whole curriculum. So they're not getting access to the curriculum. So I think there's, there's the, the guidance is, is, is important, but it needs to be real for those that are dealing with it to understand it. And I think, uh, and not leave vagueness, because what vagueness does is an excuse to not fund it properly. Uh, and that's what's happening. Just to support um, what Seamus was saying there, I think, uh, like you were saying, we fully support the ideals of mainstreaming. But again, it's a concern of how it works in practice. And I think mainstreaming, if funded well and training provided for all members of staff well, is brilliant. I think when you don't fund it well, when you don't train people well, then just like what Seamus was indicating there, it actually becomes a bit dangerous for kids um, with additional support needs. Because actually, instead of getting fully rounded support to be actually integrated as part of the school, you become something which is stuck on the side, which is given um, half-hearted support, and again, with half-hearted specialisation. One of the things that we asked the Scottish Government was about the numbers of additional support needs teachers in the Scottish system. And we asked, um, 
how many were there, if there was declining, um, if there was more. And we just got, the answer we got was there are more teachers in education than ever before, um, which was a stock answer. And unfortunately, that didn't get to the nub of what we we're trying to get to, was, which is that we're concerned about the eroding of specialism within schools and the eroding of specialist knowledge. And I think kind of, again, what Seamus was saying is, you know, to be an additional support needs teacher, you actually don't need any qualifications other than being a teacher. There's no set mandatory training required. There's no set um, development that you have to undertake for that position. And we have thousands of ASN teachers up and down the country who do incredible jobs to take it upon themselves to become specialists themselves. The question that I would have is, should that be on them? Should that be on them to figure that out? Or should we have a system which is more robust in equipping our teachers with the skills and knowledge that they acquire uh, to support children? Can you Sorry. I think Mr. Shearson wants to bend first. Look. No, just to, to follow on for that point, I mean, there, isn't, uh, there is a lack of qualifications for teachers to take ASN. Uh, and I think it's, it's something we should be looking at uh, other examples in other countries where ASN teachers are experienced teachers that have trained and become ASN teachers. We, we, we don't tend to do that. Uh, it tends to be whoever may have a, a, an opportunity as a management opportunity to manage that sort of system, and they do they have to do most of it on their own. Um, and, I, and that's not how the system should be. It should be seen as a priority uh, and something to aspire to. Uh, but it's seen, as I said earlier, it's the poor relation in many schools is because we're hearing many stories of ASN teachers who are taken off their duties to cover vacancies and, uh, and cover classes. And that's not what they were there for. You know? And that tells you how the school views them, is that, that oh, if there's a, a shortage, we'll just drag them out and let the poor children do whatever they need to do on their own. And that's, that's happening, unfortunately, too often. Yes, of course. I just want one more question. Just a very brief point. On um, the subject of expertise, etc., when a child comes to you uh, to a school with additional needs, do you get a clinical or a psychological assessment, of, or does the teacher get get that? Really. Really. Yeah, and if it does happen, it's after a long process to get to that particular point. Uh, and I think there's, uh, if you just look at the, the number of teachers that are uh, learning support ASN in primary, has reduced considerably in the last last year. And those in the central have reduced as well. But the expertise, uh, schools can wait many, many months for an assessment. Uh, yeah. And that's not fair because in the meantime, the schools and the teachers are trying to do the best yeah. in, the, in the period in between. We, an ideal si system would be to, uh, if you identify the, the youngsters at a very early stage before going to school, and actually have that tracked throughout the system. And I think that's one of the difficulties with each authority doing their own way of doing it. There's no consistency. Uh, and then if the youngsters move across authorities, then you know, it's not followed. It's like a new process yeah. has to begin. Yeah. Because the authority surely has an assessment that they could pass on to the school, but that doesn't happen. It doesn't always get to the right people. OK, mm. okay thank you. Um, Ms Smith? Yeah. Just the last point. Um, Mr Searson, can I just ask about the, the, the issue about um, teachers who are uh, well-trained in this area? Um, the, this committee has been made aware of uh, three special schools, and there may be more, uh, which are under capacity just now, namely that they have spaces for children who um, would perhaps be uh, better looked after in a special uh, school. Um, is the teaching profession making any comment about that? Is there a reluctance to um, suggest that these uh, children might be better looked after in a specialist environment? Well, the, the situation is that many teachers uh, you know, at schools are expected to keep and the youngsters in their schools, and partly it's because of finances because the, the, the amount of money it's going to cost for that youngster to go to some of those places is, you know, the council will do all it can because of the financial restrictions to prevent that happening. And that's a, that's a mistake, because what it means is that that youngster then is frustrated, struggles in the school situation, the teachers can't cope with them, and, and there's tremendous... Pre and unfortunately, the thing that schools are prevented from doing now is excluding children from schools. Now, exclusion is not just a punishment, it's not a punishment, it's a, a, that, that youngster cannot cope in the, in the school environment. So therefore, what schools have been told is don't exclude the youngsters, you've got a, a quota, you can't go beyond that quota, and therefore the needs of the individual youngsters aren't being met. And some of our youngsters need to be somewhere else. I'm not just talking about in specialist schools, but in other units and other things to cope with. Uh, and unfortunately, that's part of, as I said earlier, 
it's the biggest thing that we've had coming through in our pay dis dispute is the when we've asked members the question is the, what they're having to cope with inside schools, not just workload, but pupil behaviour, the uh, lack of support. So I think, you know, if you like, the next number of months, they will be the major issues for the teacher unions. Mr. Ward, do you want to come in? Yeah, so we, we are, thank you. We are a membership organisation, so we've got um, members all across the country. And the things that we keep hearing time and time again is that even with the presumption of mainstreaming, what that means in reality, sadly, for so many families is that they have to fight tooth and nail to get the appropriate placement for their child. And what we've actually done is we've perversely created a system where a child has to fail in school to get in a mainstream school to get the specialist place at the choir because, like Sharon's was saying, local authorities don't want to pay for it. Um, and that is an absolutely abhorrent situation because what you've got from our members is, you know, and I think it affects other um, additional support needs as well, but you've got autistic children who are being basically set up for a series of traumatic experiences and the family being set up for a series of traumatic experiences um, all to get their child to the place where it needs to be. Now, that's not fair on the family, it's not fair on the child, it's also not fair on the teachers, because actually teachers don't deserve to have that situation happen to them. They deserve the training and the skills to be able to cope with it, or they deserve for that child to be in the most appropriate setting, not for them have to mess up within their classroom. Start. Yeah. Um, it, it, was just, it was just really to, to make a point that I, I would caution against viewing bricks and mortar as, as the solution. The solution that, that we find is it's people. So it's about how we take that specialism and that specialist knowledge and that specialist expertise and insert it into, into the whole system, a whole system approach. Because any, any success stories we hear is where a person has made a difference. It's not about where a setting has made a difference. And, and there, are, there are children who will be benefited who will benefit from a specialist skill placement. I'm, I'm not here to say that, that we will never have special skills, but what I would say is that is not the black and white solution that, that where something is not going right in mainstream, that, that the solution is that a specialist placement would be better. It's about how do we inject some of that specialism, that knowledge and that expertise into making a success of mainstream placements as well. Okay. Dr. Allen. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, I was interested in, in what was being said there, uh, Mr Searson, about the multiple different names for things, but in particular, two different names that you, you referred to, I think, in your own evidence, and that is coordinated support plans and uh, child plans. Uh, could either any of the panel say something about their understanding of the difference between these and try and tease those out, please? Well, it, uh, uh, at the IRSA, uh, ASN committee a couple of weeks ago, we, we had this discussion. There were a number of teachers from different authorities, and each of them called it something different, and what it meant was something different. Uh, and that's why I made the point earlier, is that they are completely different, and in the interpretation of what they are. And I think that's where the, we need some sort of a common approach to what these various things are, and effectively one, one name for it, with the same guidelines in, uh, of how those things are, in, are, are used. My understanding is, am I right, that these are not just two different names for the same thing, these are two fundamentally different things and two fundamentally different offerings to a child, am I right? Yeah. It's, it depends on which authority you're talking about, and that, that's, what, that's the way the confusion is. Uh, the, each authority seems to think, well, if we cut back on the CSPs, we can put something else in place which is much more manageable. Uh, and I think that's the problem, is that they're not using what they should be using. Uh, because they, they realise there's a financial implication on it. Mm -hmm. But so they introduce something different. And if it's, it's often, as I said earlier, it's often left to the schools to determine how to make the most of this. Uh, and I think that's, that's a problem as well. And I can see this potentially being more difficult with the head teacher's charter, with more empowerment to the schools and more control over that, is that they will then start to interpret their own plans as well. Uh, and they'll have the same problem that local authorities have, is they won't be able to afford all the things they will need to meet those young. But they, they should be all the same, uh, but they're not. Uh, and the different people involved. Some of the plans that you have referred to there have multi-agency involvement. Some of them don't. Uh, and it varies from each authority who's available to be put into those. So I, I suppose that's very helpful. I suppose what I'm interested to hear from the panel as well is, given that uh, it looks as if um, the number of indivi individual, going by your own evidence here again, uh, the number of individualised education programmes and coordinated support plans decreased from 2011 to 16, while the number of child plans increased. 
I'd be interested to, to know what you feel the implication for that is for the child or for the young person and what, what your take on that is specifically. I think it, it, uh, my interpretation of that, as I said, is, is the difference in you know, what we need to do is that if you've got different variations and how it's applied is that the only peop people that are losing out of this are the youngsters themselves because they're not going to get a plan that covers all, all their particular needs. Because uh, if you, And it comes back again to the training of the teachers involved in this process. If they haven't got the background and understanding, they won't know the full implication of what is available to them. And I feel that that's, that's why I say the training of, is, is so critical in all of this. Uh, can be is that something the, the panel want to come in on as well, the rest of them? Or? It would be just to, to, to maybe restate that, that distinction between a coordinated support plan and a child's plan. A coordinated support plan is an education plan. A child's plan is, is a more whole... You might have a, child, a coordinated support plan as part of your child's plan. Um, so it, it was just to kind of restate that, that understanding in terms of it being an education plan, a, a coordinated support plan, um, and obviously having that, that statutory element to it in terms of enforceability and accountability. Um, and what we, what we do need, to, to Seamus's point, is guidance and understanding and training on that distinction and also how planning works in the round and how plans talk to each other, etc. Um, and a more consistent approach to other plans. Coordinated support plans are, are fairly set in terms of what, what they should look like, and, um, but other plans that talk to them and, and, and sit alongside them might need a bit more guidance and understanding. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. We um, can move to Mr Greer. Thank you very much, uh, Convener. Um, just like to go back to um, Seamus's opening comments about the impact that this is having on teachers and support staff. And wonder if you could detail that a little bit more. It's something that the committee's um, heard about a lot, the, the knock-on impact that this is having on staff and then uh, the impact that subsequently has on all the young people that they are responsible for. Uh, teachers... Uh are very committed to what they're doing. Uh, and I've, I've made them mention twice on pay, and I'll mention it again. Pay is not the only issue for them. A lot of teachers would say to you that not necessarily in it for the money. And as a union, we'd probably argue, that, you, know, you you need teachers well paid, or else there won't be all the, 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 the classrooms vacant. Uh, so therefore, but the, react, the, the frustration that teachers have is that they are working up to the maximum in their contract, which is 22 and a half hours contact time because of the cutbacks over the last few years. They're expected to uh, focus on all the other things that they would do with their, with their job, but they get very frustrated if there's one or two youngsters there they can't make you know, real contact with and understand. And sometimes they don't understand why that's the case. Uh, and they, they seek support from others, and the, the, there isn't a lot of support. Some people might say, well, that, that youngster's OK with me, but we don't always know why. And I think teachers... Uh, get, get very stressed by that because what they tend to do is try and spend more time with that youngster to prevent the frustrations of that youngster at the disadvantage of all the other youngsters in the class. Uh, and I think that's why it, it, the teachers themselves are desperate for support, but they want the expertise close to hand, you know, inside the school, not in the authority uh, that they might see once a week or once every two weeks if they've got time. Uh, and so in terms of teachers, I mean, the stress of teachers has gone up considerably because they're having to deal with this on a regular basis. And sometimes uh, the reasons for disruption are low-level disruption or behaviour, but it could be far other things as well, but they don't always know. Uh, and it doesn't help uh, that there isn't the opportunity to actually understand that, uh, uh, get trained in some of these things or awareness in some instances so they can actually deal with some of the problems that they face. It's... Uh as, as you mentioned, it's a, it's a vicious cycle of, you know, I used to be a teacher myself and I, I know very well the experience of not having enough time, having too many kids, wanting to give a child the time to really understand them, but then also not having the skills and the specialism to know what I can do in my classroom to support them, becoming frustrated with that child and then that relationship breaking down and the whole thing becoming more challenging. And I think, you know, like Shima says, there is a resourcing issue, I think, about time but I, I think the thing that I would say is that there's something also about training and about skills um, one of our calls and I know Seamus said you know everyone thinks initial teacher education is the answer to everything um, but we do and the, the problem is that you know if you're a teacher uh, training in Scotland 
the quality of your training on additional support needs is also vastly variable. So you could go to an institution, for example, where you might get in your entire training maybe a half day or a couple of hours on additional support needs and given a couple of pointers about where to look if you, know, you happen to have a kid that needs support in your class. Or you could go to an institution where actually you get some really brilliant training, which is practical about things that you can do in your classroom to stop there being sensory overload. And we're always saying that actually, if you can make it work for the additional support needs child, it generally speaking works for everyone else as well, which I think is really powerful. But in order to get to that point, there has to be an investment at some point in that training and education. And we would say that, we would argue, the National Statistics Society and Children in Scotland and Scottish Autism would argue, that that point is actually an initial teacher education where you need to lay a really firm foundation that allows teachers to use that to develop future on, uh, further on in their career to stop the cycle at the beginning. Uh, I've just, I'll kind of move this on a, a mm. little bit, but feel free to come back on anything that you missed there. Um, the, I'm interested in the points in the process at which the, the lack of adequate uh, support and resource, whether it's the lack of any staff at all or the lack of staff with uh, relevant training uh, and expertise, at what point in the process is that most acute? Is it at the stage of identifying uh, additional needs? Is it at the stage of uh, placing, of uh, making the decisions around uh, where a young person with particular additional needs should be? Is it entirely within the schools? Uh, are there particular shortages within the local authorities? Where are the, the acute issues uh, that come from a lack of staff and a lack of staff with the relevant knowledge? I, I, I would uh, say is that because there is a lack of knowledge, it can be a long way into a child's career before these things are, are, are picked up. Um, and I think that that's why we need a coordinated approach from very early years right through through the set. Because it, it shouldn't come as a surprise. Some authorities, for example, at the moment using some of the PEF funding, are you, uh, some schools are using a, what they call a transition teacher to go into the primary schools to identify the youngsters, get to know the youngsters, and actually do that first, if you like, signal to the school that there's some youngsters there that will need some additional support. Now, that's a decision the school's made itself, uh, but that should be much more of a, a, a normal process. Um, but uh, I, th I think that the <sighs> it takes too long, uh, uh, and I feel that it's, it's that uh, ability for the, for the youngsters to get the best out of their education, because if, the longer they get frustrated, the longer that, you know, that, that the worse the problem becomes. And as his colleague said there earlier, it could be that you know that they have to mess up before somebody starts to notice it. And I think uh, I would argue that uh, we need to be looking at it in a grown-up and real way and actually say what is the issue and let's deal with it properly. And um, I'd like to uh, go to a point. It kind of relates to something that Nick brought up before. You, you were talking about the challenge of getting accurate um, information in terms of uh, teachers qualified to or teachers working uh, <clears throat> with young people with additional needs. Um, the staff census now has uh, undergone a, a number of changes. One of those changes is uh, the merging of some categories. So uh, the number of additional support needs assistants will no longer be counted and published separately. It's been merged into pupil support assistant with the general classroom assistant category. Um, do you have any concerns about the impact that that might have? Oh, oh sorry. Um, I, 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 what I would say, really, in terms of so, well, I understand the, the the real interest in that data because there is a, a, a real feeling that, that actually classroom support assistance or people support assistance or the, the various rules and guises that that that. that exist in the system. Um, they play a, a huge role in supporting pupils who have additional support needs um, and they play a, a really vital role and are seen as a, as, as a, a crucial asset. So of course keeping keeping an awareness and visibility of how many of them there are is, is important. Um, but what I would say is what's, what's more important is the work that they are doing and actually looking at the quality of support that is provided to them, training that is provided to them and um, what they're being deployed to do, um, because we, we are in some places misusing uh, this, these various roles that exist. And I, I think that's maybe where the sort of merging of all that data came from was that one thing that, that, that we called for and included in the main was a consistent offering, a consistent role type, a consistent um, training type, um, and a consistent quality of what, what that's 
key and vital resource was delivering. Um, so yes, we need to keep on top of, of the number that exists and, and that we, should, we don't want to see that decreasing, but we also want to look at actually what they're doing. Um, and and that's, there's, there's plenty of research out there around effective deployment of, of classroom support um, and where, it's, where it works and where it doesn't work. And that's about how it's deployed and how it's utilised and how people are, are skilled to, to be in that role. Yeah, I, I think it's a backward step uh, because uh, ASN support is, is very specialised work. Uh, and when you start to blend other classroom assistance into that, you lose that expertise. And also the assumption in the schools is that one is interchangeable with the other, and they're not. And I think with the number of children with ASN, we need to be looking at, uh, if anything, as a crude figure, if, if you know, the, the government likes lots of figures, is that they should be seen, if, if we've got the number of children going up, the number of people involved should be going up and not the other way around. I mean, it's, it's interesting because uh, in, in the, the chart that we, we supplied previously, it's page 23, where we looked at the number of authorities but took them in the order of number of children going down, there's such a big discrepancy in what each authority does. And it's quite sad to think, if we compare Glasgow and Aberdeen, uh, ASN staff in Aberdeenshire was higher than Glasgow, and then in the last week or so, we've heard that Aberdeen are talking about removing its ASN teachers and replacing them with ASN classroom assistants or classroom assistants. Uh, now, that's a, uh, now, that doesn't help the situation. So, I think it's very important if we are going to use these statistics, just do them properly and actually identify the skills that these people do uh, and make them very different. And if anything, a training programme for ASN support is, is, is equally, you know, twice as important. The, the final point that shows me was exactly what I was going to say. The, 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 the problem is that in reality, for the vast majority, you know, she was just saying, you know, that there is a difference between being, a, I think you, Kayleigh was saying, there's a difference between being a pupil support assistant and a classroom assistant. Now, there absolutely is in the skills that you need to use, in the different things that you need to be able to do with people, in your understanding, awareness of situations. The sad thing is, though, that there is actually no required difference in training. So there's not like if you're going to be a pupil support assistant working with an autistic person or two autistic people all day every day there's no requirement that you have specialist training in autism there's no requirement that you have specialist knowledge and understanding or have demonstrated those skills now again just like I was saying at the beginning there are thousands of PSAs up and down this country that do incredible work and who are brilliant but that's not enough it's not enough that we just take it on goodwill that actually these people are really kind and they're very nice and they support people and they walk them to classes and they, they give them comfort what we actually need them to be is skilled I wanted them to know, have knowledge to support people properly. Um, and I had not heard about the, what was going to happen in Aberdeen, but that concerns me hugely that Aberdeen Council will be considering a move like that. Aberdeen Aberdeen yeah. Aberdeen 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 okay. And just one final question, yeah. Kavina, if that's okay. Ruth, did you have a supplementary or is it another idea? It's okay. okay. Grand, thanks. Um, it's just on. Uh, on the direction of travel around this, this is the, the second time this session that the committee's uh, been looking at additional support needs. We're revisiting the, the work that we've previously done. In that kind of intervening two years, has the direction of travel um, at local authority in school level been towards better definition of these roles? Because there can be a disconnect between what is collected in the national census and what's actually happening on the ground. Is the census accurately reflecting the fact that on the ground there's an increasingly grey area and these roles are increasingly overlapping because of a lack of definition, a lack of training? Or is there a disconnect between the census and actually there has been some progress towards more clearly defined roles? I, I would say that there's, it, it's been, a, a, as I said there, the interpretation in schools is, is a, you know, where people are from different roles are expected to take on different tasks. But just looking at the figures, for example, uh, in our figures we gave that the secondary learning support and ASN teachers is 1,215 in 2016. Uh, it's about the same. It's about one more, I think, in the, in the latest information. But the number in primary schools is dropped by 10%. Uh, and when you go to centrally based ASN teachers, that's dropped by 23% uh, in, in, in a year. Now, that doesn't tell me that things are improving. This is actually more cus uh, cutting away from the vital support that's needed. Thank you. Mr Ward, did you want to come? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The one thing I would add to that is that um, the, I, the, it, it does sound like things aren't improving, but one thing that I would say that we've really noticed is that the will is there, that teachers want to be able to support 
additional support needs kids. They want to be able to get more training. They want to have the skills and knowledge to do it. And it's about can we as a system figure out how to supply that demand. Mr Scott, you indicated you want to come in yeah. in this area. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, can I further these questions that, or the points you're making about training? If I read the pupil census figures that were provided for 2017, in primary schools, um, the average uh, number of pupils identified with additional support needs is running at 23.5%, so one in five. So we take an average class of 30 children in an average Scottish primary class, there'll be at least six of those children with uh, a, a, some kind of additional support need. Your contention this morning is those six kids are not getting the support they need because the training has not been, has not kept track or kept up with the growth in identified needs. Yes. And the answer to that is? The, so the answer to that that we would argue is for greater consistency in initial teacher education about what training people get. As um, Shima said, you can't get all your training, but if we have a level of consistency and agreement between different universities about what that baseline looks like, and then we have a system of professional development that people can access throughout their careers that actually means something, that builds upon things, that builds upon expertise. And we have head teachers who are willing to allow people to do that and to release people who pays for it is a different question, then I think that is the answer. Okay. And the, presumably the other related point to that is as we expand ch uh, nursery care in Scotland, a lot of, a lot of uh, more young children, i.e. preschool children, will be seen by teaching staff, by, sorry, nursery staff at a younger age, and therefore their needs will, could be identified earlier, which would be, by definition, a good thing. Have you any sense of training at, for nursery staff, um, Pratt, so that those children are identified and therefore their the, the uh, statement that goes with, with those children as they go into primary school can help uh, classroom teachers later up the school ages? I, like, I, you're 100% right that the earlier a diagnosis or, um, is put in place or the earlier an understanding of a child's condition is put in place, the difference that can make to the outcomes of that child's life is huge. Um, I'm not aware of any system of training for nursery teachers. No, uh, and I want to thank you very much for that. Uh, maybe I could ask Seamus Searson about um, uh, secondary teachers, because again, the same pupil census um, convener says that I think the figure is 29.6, a thick end of one third, which I find really quite astonishingly high, are now identified with special needs. Again, your sense of training for sure. secondary training teachers? Training is a vital component, but it, uh, all teachers work as part of a team. Sure. Uh, uh, they're not isolated, even though they may be in a classroom on their own most of the time, but they do need a support of all other people and other experts. Mm. And I'm using that word because there's a whole range of experts that we could be using and supporting mm. youngsters in schools. Uh, I do feel that initial teacher education is a starting point, but it's only a starting point. Uh, it's often just to raise awareness. Uh, we should be talking about proper professional development right through teachers' careers, right up until the very end. Because things are changing. I mean, we've, yeah. we at the moment are running ourselves as a union some auti under, uh, autism awareness courses for our members in their own time outside of the, the, the... Because people are asking us, can you do something about this? And we are looking... And that's just one example. But I think... Uh, and th what we found is that there were, most of those people that came were very experienced teachers who hadn't had the opportunity to actually understand some of those things. But I think it's building that team. The training needs to be... Uh, and I'll give you an example. When somebody learns to drive, uh, that's like a, a teacher coming out of university. They know how to drive, uh, but it's, it's only with the experience that they uh, become a much more experienced driver. But when somebody asks them to, to uh, repair the car, you can't do that in a one-hour session on a training day. You need to have experience and proper training. It's, it's, the, de it's, the, it's the content of the training mm -hmm. uh, and not just a superficial training, tick box exercise, or we spent an hour on a, on a training day doing something, therefore you know what to do. The answer is that's not how it works. Yeah. Thank you. Can I just, uh, one, uh, just clarify a point you made to, to Ross Greer just a minute or two ago? Did your arg argument in the context of classroom assistance is they have not had any training whatsoever? Is that in terms of additional support needs? That was what Nick said. Yeah. Well, some will have had training and some will have opted to have training, and that's brilliant. But again, it's the but inconsistency. Forgive me, some. What does, do we well, know how many? No. 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 And yeah. there's, no, there's no systemic program or system uh, for training people up across different local authorities. Or Some local authorities will have their own ones, sure. but sure. again, it's, it's patchwork. It's patchwork. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Ms. Goldruth. 
Here, good morning to the panel. Um, I'd like to pick up on something Jim Searson said earlier on about there need to be experts in our schools. And I think we need to be a bit careful about suggesting that there's not already expertise in, in some of our schools. And I think in particular, uh, with regard to secondary schools, we heard from Professor Sheila Riddle last week about um, additional support needs departments. And in most of our secondary schools, we'll have a support for learning department, at least. Um, so would you accept then perhaps that some of the challenge is that actually it's not about a, a reduction in teachers, it's a move to employ employing ASN teachers centrally and perhaps we're losing knowledge therefore at a school level because there's a central employment of ASN teachers as opposed to in SFL departments. Well see if, if somebody's centrally employed yeah. uh, they're not in the school day to day uh -huh. uh, and therefore not always available and when they are coming into schools it's probably to give advice and, and support but not necessarily supporting the youngster in the classroom mm. and, and that's what some teachers actually want. Uh, so I, I feel that the, it, we, we need people with expertise at, at the local authority level, but we need the expertise in the school as well. Uh, and unfortunately, as we said earlier, some of the teachers uh, go into ASM because they're very committed and want to be there, but they're not necessarily trained up to the right levels. And I think the schools need to understand that if you're going to encourage people to do those things, then we need to invest in them uh, to actually be trained and be m more useful in the school environment. I would agree with that, but you also don't need to have any qualifications to become a principal teacher. So, for example, I didn't need any additional qualifications to become a PT in a secondary school. So this isn't just about ASN teachers. We should be looking in the, in the main, I suppose, at actually qualifications, if that's what you're suggesting. Well, I would argue that principal teachers do, do need to be trained mm -hmm. before they become PTs. But there is no requirement at the present time. No, there isn't a prime, but, but uh, I would argue all members of staff for any sort of management position or leading mm -hmm. the subject need to be trained in those areas. Yeah, I think uh, there's a baseline expectation that happens, but there is no requirement. So I think we need to be careful at just narrowly looking at ASM provision and saying it doesn't happen here because it doesn't happen across the piece at the moment. Uh, could, could I, uh, I, mean, it's, I, I don't think because it doesn't happen now, it doesn't mean it's right. That's why I make the point. I think it's very important that we do plan and manage our staff and develop our staff to their full potential. Yeah. We've got lots of people who are get promoted into posts who struggle for a long while because mm -hmm. they've not been prepared for it. And I think that so we need to be, so, be careful just because it's, it's happening now without those things. We need to be able to say, what's a better way of doing it? Yeah, so on that point about supporting staff then, um, I was quite taken by Kayleigh Thorpe's point with regard to the importance of people and this not just being about, you know, bricks and mortar. And the SSTA submission points to, you know, 93% of ASM pupils now being taught in mainstream classes all the time. I think you also hit upon um, a pretty critical and educationally controversial point, and that's the potential for disruption um, and potential impact on overall attainment. Um, and you also talk about the impact on teacher stress and potential absenteeism. Mm -hmm. So if this is about getting the right people to make the interventions then, as Kelly Thorpe told us, do we need to consider how our local authorities uh, look after staff wellbeing? Uh, most definitely. I mean, because... Uh, I feel that it, we, we, we need to really address t teacher health and wellbeing. Um, and I think we play lip service to it at the moment. Uh, and local authorities try to do something with it. But we've got to be realistic is if teachers are stressed in the classroom, it's, it's the responsibility of all of us to try and prevent that stress or, or address that stress. And I think it would be a nice situation where we could be that actually uh, teachers felt comfortable. And I, I'm, I'm using this as a good example. Some of our inexperienced teachers are frightened to express to senior colleagues that they're struggling with some of the youngsters because they feel it's a failing on their part. And I think we need to be grown up and say to actually, no, everybody has a struggle with some of our youngsters and we need to support to, uh, to, uh, and make that uh, what I refer to as a more collegiate way of working. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was, it was going back to um, what you were saying about uh, ASN teachers being employed centrally and not locally. Mm, yeah. Now, she Seamus um, made a really good point, I think, which is the idea of like what is effective development of you as a teacher. Now, actually, there's quite a lot of evidence that the most effective professional development that teachers can undertake is actually classroom coaching. So the idea of someone sitting in your class, watching you teach, providing you advice as you teach, you moderating, you, um, moderating and changing your behaviour, doing it again, practising. Now, if that is what a lot of the research is saying is the most effective way of doing it, you're quite unlikely as a teacher, particularly if you feel some of the things that she was just saying, to be happy with this person you see once in a blue moon coming in and observing your classroom. What you need is a collegiate person, someone that's there every day that you can build a relationship with and who you can have a relationship of trust with. Mm. Um, and I think that's potentially what starts to, you start to lose that, that sort of innate trust, um, which I think is a bit of a shame. Yeah, okay, and, and just a final point then. And it's with regard to the increase in social, emotional and behavioural difficulties as a category of ESN, um, which obviously increased 
the, the, the most amount uh, between 2010 and 2017. I asked a question last week about this, you know, dramatic increase and whether or not there might be a link politically. And I appreciate if the panel members don't feel they, they are able to mention this, but, you know, we had a change of government in 2010. We had a change of administration in Westminster. You know, the beginning of austerity, lots of changes to the benefit system. We know that poverty impacts upon a child's ability to attain uh, to, and to reach their potential. So I wonder if you're aware of any analysis, therefore, um, in terms of you know, austerity on uh, ESN in particular in the classroom? What, what we're aware of, so I don't have any statistics, unfortunately, I am sorry, but what we are aware of is that um, our members come to us talking about ex like increased, I suppose, existential stress. Yeah. So, you know, so often families of autistic people have to talk to us about um, fighting for their rights in education, fighting for their rights in other areas. And I think particularly with elements of universal credit that have come in, um, there's also been a feeling that they have to fight for their rights of their children as they become adults um, and what that looks like. And we have um, examples of people who, you know, their child is, is non-verbal, very, very, very high need, requires incredible specialist provision the whole time, being asked to turn up, uh, you know, for a PIP assessment and, and, and saying, well, they can't do that. And they say, well, we can come to the hospital and mm. do it with them there and it's just that's not appropriate and it's not right yeah. um and that level of stress really starts to affect people so we have we, have, we know that that's been a thing whether i obviously we can't see it that's down to a change in government we can just see that we've noticed this mm -hmm. thank you the obvious thing is austerity and poverty mm -hmm. does come into the schools because schools have what goes on in society and the frustration with some of the youngsters of it comes in with it as well and i feel that also, there's been a change in that uh, uh, the expectations on teachers to try and do more and more uh, makes it equally as difficult. So, uh, it's, I would like to say it was the change in government, but I'm not, I'm not able to. Uh, but I do think, you know, the cutbacks over the years, we've seen, and, and, the re and if you like, the practical piece of that is where these people existed in the past, when they left, they weren't replaced. Uh, and I think that's, you can see that in every school. You know, those are the things that have gone by the way. Uh, and it tends to be, whereas if you lose an English teacher, you have to replace an English teacher. If you lose an ASN teacher or an ASN classroom assistant, you, you muddle through. And that's what's unfortunately what's happened. So if that's one example, practical example of it, that, then that you see that in every school. Thank you. Um, just before we move on, if, if I could ask um, a question in relation to some of the conversations I had around statistics and the fact that some of the categories were dropped because there wasn't consistency across local authorities and definition and reporting and that um, uh, we're talking about the numbers of ASN pupils. We heard last week that the, the, that spectrum of ASN pupil is, is very different. So someone with a temporary need of a broken arm in the school will be categorised and counted as one additional support needs along with you know someone who doesn't have English as their first language additional support need and given the fact that we do have um, plans of some kind um, in the schools for a lot of um, the, the young people who have been assessed as need did you think it is a pretty blunt instrument just to count them that way do you think that there's a possibility to actually capture the need of the young person, which maybe would help local authorities plan for what's, what actually is needed in a classroom, because one child categorised as autistic could have a, a very different support need from another child in that category. Yes, ab absolutely. Um, and I think it, it does happen. Um, so I think, you know, if you look at different, the range of different plans, they do go into a lot of detail. They do talk about um, what those needs look like and what they might present as and, and where they come from. I think what would be really interesting, there was a bit of a statistical analysis on that. Um, that would be fascinating and I, w I've not seen one, but I would be really interested to see that because you're right, it is a broadening category um, and a bit like autism itself, it's a spectrum and the, and the different needs in that spectrum might require quite different approaches. In terms of the numbers going up, I would argue that the numbers have always been there. It's just that teachers are now more able to identify that there's a need of youngsters. So yeah. I don't see it as a, it could be a slight increase because for other reasons, but I would say there has always been the needs of youngsters in the schools, it's just that we've not always been able to identify them. Uh, but we do need to address that. And I think what was suggested there, I think we do need a, an in-depth analysis of ASN uh, because it's, 
we should be measuring what we think is important, not what somebody else thinks is important. I think if we understand ASM properly and all the different categories and all the different elements to it, then we can determine what statistics we want. You know, just crude statistics uh, on classroom assistance as one and blending them all together is not helpful. Uh, so I do think we do need a proper, a, a proper detailed research into the, the, the complex needs of ASN, uh, which is then identified and possibly uh, it might be better uh, identifying what funding would be needed for each of those types of categories. So at the moment we've got, we're only uh, guessing, I would, I would imagine, in most cases. Thank you. Um, Dr. Allen, you wanted to something? Thank you. It's really just to pick up on your point there about languages um, uh, and really just to ask your views a bit more about that. I've got a bit of an interest in languages and while I would have no doubt that there are, there are children and young people who require additional interventions um, because of the fact that English isn't their, their first language, I just, just wonder what your feelings were about the fact that there are lots of children uh, for whom having two languages is quite a good thing. Uh, 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 intellectually, it's quite a good thing and something we should celebrate. So, how do you draw the distinction uh, in putting this this large group of children who perhaps don't have English as their first language uh, into that category? How is the distinction drawn between young people who require help and young people who may be entirely fluent and whose whose bilingualism we should be actually celebrating? Uh, I know it's, it's it's a different area to what we've talked about, but uh, I, I read, uh, when I I used to teach in London, in East End of London, and we had a, a big influx of Bangladeshi children, um, and the assumption is they've all got the same needs. No, right. they haven't. That's you've got yeah, you know, you've got they've got some youngsters come there who would have a higher level of language ability than most of the children that I was yeah. teaching in the area, and then others hadn't, hadn't even set foot in a school. So it, it's it's not as it, yeah, but, and it is a real. Uh, benefit to a school if a school is able to harness that ex expertise because it's a tremendous ability uh, and it's something I'm very I'm, I'm particularly passionate it should be for every youngster throughout their school career uh, and but building on the language that youngsters bring this into the school should be seen as a benefit and not just say we, we, we're just going to uh, focus on, on particular languages because that's all we can offer I think there's another challenge there for schools to address that but do you, do you think it's helpful that all of these children that you've just described are, are counted in the statistic for additional I think they should be counted, but they shouldn't be counted in one in one block. They need to have a whole range of where they, you know, of their abilities in their okay. their own languages. Yeah. It, it was just a really quick point on that, but my understanding of it in terms of it, it might not give uh, having English as a second language might not give rise to an additional support need. That that it's the that's the factor that gives rise to an additional support need. So you, you might not categorise all those children okay. as having an additional support need because if they're fluent in English, then they, they probably okay. don't have an additional support need. If that's how it works in practice, I, I can't say, but that is my understanding of how it, how it should be applied. The, um, I also used to teach in East London um, in a school that had lots of Bangladesh. We obviously need to compare notes uh, <laughs> a bit later. Um, and the thing that I would say is that what's interesting about maybe the difference with English as additional language is that often what we'd find is that when children would come in, they needed very intense support. Uh -huh. But, but there's, a pro there's a progress through that. And that intense support gets to a point where they don't need that support anymore. And like you were saying, that additional language actually acts as a wonderful cushion and support for them to um, explore English, for example, more yeah. and literature more and bring in different parts mm -hmm. of cultures. So I suppose there's a, there's a more obvious journey there from I can't speak English to I can speak English or I, I need less support speaking English than if you've got additional support needs where that journey is not linear and in fact there may not even be a destination at the end. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Lamont. Yep. Um, thanks very much. I mean, I was struck by um, what was said earlier about PEF money being used to employ a transition teacher. I've been out teaching 20 years. It was routine for the learning support teacher to go to all the feeder primaries and get information on all the young people and identify ones that you really needed to look after when they come into secondary school. So I'm astonished if we're not... That tells me something about what's happening in schools if that's regarded as, um, as unusual. I suppose I'm quite interested in, in looking at the point where this policy is no longer a policy. Um, first of all, around this question of flexible timetables. Can you give some examples... I mean, I've read, you know, the Enable report and I've read the report from um, the National Autism Society and so on. And it feels to me that some of these young people who have got a flexible timetable are exactly what you said, present but not included. 
Do you have, have you got examples of what those the variation is around that, of what that might mean for individual families? Um, yes, um, I think that there, there, some of that comes through and included in the main. We, we heard stories of young people attending school one one hour a week, um, and I do think there we, there is value perhaps in looking at some of the data on home education um, and and perhaps doing a bit of a deep dive into that in terms of understanding why some young people are, are, are moving to home education because uh, uh, my suspicion and through some of the, the, the anecdotal evidence we receive is because they are not they are not being supported and ca cannot be supported in, in their school at present. Um, so there, there are pretty stark um, stories out there in terms of um, either part-time timetables or in some occasions, I would describe it more as an informal exclusion um, in terms of it's not recorded, but they are routinely being asked, or parents are routinely being asked to, to take their child home. Um, and that's 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 missing from all of all of the data as as those you, those young people's experiences um, and and what what is their life going to look at look like once they reach the age of eighteen if they've not been at any form of schooling or very little form of schooling. Um, so. There is some data in terms of those part-time timetables, but there is there is some gaps in the data in terms of the number who have who've elected for home education. But has that been because they've got to the point where it's, there's there's no other option? Mm -hmm. That's all right. Um, just just to build on that, um, we wouldn't call them informal exclusions. We would call them unlawful exclusions. So these are people who are being asked to stay at home when they have an entitlement to education, and it's against the law, and it's happening all the time. And it's a scandal, um, to be completely honest. Now, when it comes to part-time timetables, I think you know there is some nuance required because actually part-time timetables can be hugely supportive um, to children with additional support needs. So it can be really um, meaningful to say that actually, do you know what? Maybe um, afternoons on a Wednesday. Seb really struggles, we know that, so would it be possible for him not to do that, or why don't we give him a bit more space and a bit more time? And these can make a big difference, actually, to children that need support in adapting or that can sometimes feel overwhelmed and need time out and things. But there's a tipping point where a part-time timetable becomes an unlawful exclusion when you're being asked to pick up your child every single day without notice because that child um, because they're not able to cope with your child. There's also a tipping point where what we've seen is some examples of is part-time timetables sort of starting off, you know, the idea being that um, we'll start off with them just coming in one or two days a week and then we'll build back up to them being fully back at school. And it never happens. It never happens. And then the question starts to come for, from us is if that child is still entitled to an education, which I think we'd all agree that they are still entitled to an education, and if they're saying that that education can't happen at school, the question is, what makes them think that they're going to get a better quality of education at home? Where is the decision made that that's the best place for them to be? And then what does that education at home look like? So just like we're talking about the lack of standardisation um, across the board, there's a lack of standardisation of what home education looks like for children um, who are being educated at home. So there's no minimum hours of education. So some councils used to work on a, a system where you know, we would provide uh, five or ten minimum hours a week of education materials for children to access and to go through. Um, doesn't exist, which is really sad anymore. And I think also we have to talk about again about the quality of that. So that could look like some teachers doing absolutely amazing work and you know hosting seminars for kids and having online schools, which can be brilliant. Or it can look like here's a worksheet, fill it in. And that that's not being over dramatic. That is literally what children are still getting now. And there has to be a greater consistency there. Um, with part-time timetables, again, just to go back to the point, they are useful and they can be useful, but they can also be tools that can become abused and can very quickly become a means to unlawfully exclude a child. I mean, again, I did that job in the 80s, which was supporting young people to kind of integrate back in, and it was all about flexibility. Mm. I think my concern, my sense is that sometimes parents are actively choosing to say are, are agreeing with this simply because they want their child to be safe. So that becomes mm -hmm. a difficulty. But I just wonder whether 
we, we had this conversation earlier about specialist education versus mainstreaming. Um, is there a danger that you get to a point that simply because the reality on the ground is that there isn't the support in the school that's relevant and meaningful for the young person, that you will see a drive towards people saying, well, actually, I don't want my child to have to fail before they go to a specialist place, and you end up, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, you prove that the policy is wrong by just the reality of what people experience. Have we got as far as that yet, do you think? Because I'm aware that teachers in their, um, when they've been raising issues around pay dispute, they talk about workload and they talk about stress and they do talk about the lack of support for young people with additional support needs. Is there a danger that you actually get to a place where it's, it, the, the policy has not been lived and then there will be a move to just say, well, we need to change the policy? I absolutely think there is a danger of that if we, if we don't get it right. And I also think we have a, a responsibility to, to internationally. We have we have taken very progressive steps and, and we have a responsibility to get it right. Um, but we, 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 of course, don't want young people suffering and struggling through that to, to, prove, a, to prove a point, to prove a policy. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is the right move. We can get it right. We, we just need to take a whole systems approach and we need to to continue the investment in specialism. That's not special places, it's specialism and experts and knowledge and understanding that's training, that's whole, whole, whole career training, but it's also experts and specialist knowledge that can come in and provide that additional support. Um, and, and I think that's what we, what we have a responsibility to, to get right and to get right soon to fix okay. what we have heard over the last 16 years, the last generation, um, and continue to improve. I suppose my last question, Eunice in Scotland, um, which represents classroom assistants, in their submission, they argued that in a system with finite resource, additional support can have wider implications. It said that if a parent manages to successfully get a resource for their child, it simply involves it shifting from somebody else. Is that a problem? That, I mean, to me, the thing about the CSPs and the plans is like... Um, self-censorship. I'm not going to put that in the plan because I know I can't access it. Um, and I wonder whether that is, a, that is also a challenge in the school, that because the parent fights, they get the extra resource, but it's, it's then lost somewhere else the system. It's not, it's not guaranteeing increased support in the school. I mean, if, if I could, I mean, I think there's, uh, we need to make the policy work and make it real. Uh, at the moment, it's not that. Um, and I feel what you've just described, where money is taken from one to another, and it would be because a parent is more vocal than anybody else, uh, that they may get it, and that's wrong. Uh, that's fundamentally wrong. Uh, but it does mean somebody else loses out. So you could have, like we talked earlier, there could be five or six youngsters in a class, but the one, one parent is pushing and one youngster gets the support, where there's four or five probably as much need, don't get that at all. And I think we need to find the resource. Uh, I think it's, if we are really committed, to making this thing, you know, this, this work, then that policy needs to be real for people. Uh, and uh, that, unfortunately, is, that is going to need expertise and people coming in, but it's going to need resource and, pre and preparedness to accept that the second best isn't good enough. That's a word. I think what, um, I think sadly what Unison presented there is a deficit model, and, it's the, and I think that the current funding means that we work on a deficit model. And I think that, just like Seamus was saying, um, so I think, if I'm going back to first principles, and I mentioned this before, I think presumption of mainstreaming is the right thing, and I think it's the right way forward. However, if we do not fund it properly, if we do not build a system to deliver it properly, then we start to create a system which in some ways is worse than an older system, and in some ways has all these perverse incentives. And we're in a situation right now, which exactly as you said, Ms Lamont, that actually we have a system that favours middle class people, um, that favours middle class parents arguing and fighting. And you know, I'm not, if it was my child, I would be fighting and arguing and going mad as well. They shouldn't have to do that. We should have a system that says to them, this is what we think. That we should have a proactive system that is offering support because actually that won't then just happen to the middle class kids. That will also happen that will also happen to the working class parents as well. And I think that there's there's a, a social justice issue there that maybe we don't talk about enough that maybe should also be addressed. I wondered if the 
I mean, maybe to be controversial, and it's been highlighted already, if we've got such a broad categorisation of what additional support needs are, you know, somebody suffers a bereavement, then of course that's an episode in their lives and they have to be supported, or there's a crisis in the family, they have to be supported, and it might then there might be some reaction in school. Is there a danger of the categories that has catch everything, that actually those young people, and I don't think young people should be set against each other, but the children who are most vulnerable, who have not just got social and emotional needs, but may have needs that, if their needs are not met properly, they simply can't come to school. And you need somebody with expertise to feed them, to keep them, them safe and so on. Is there a danger that the system, this perverse incentive, that you can meet the needs of the, those who are less needy at the expense of those who probably fought hardest to get into mainstream education in the first place? Yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about my response. Um, because I, I don't want to say that... So what I, what I would say is we haven't taken a position that the, the, the definition of additional support needs should, should change or anything along those lines. Um, what I would say is the, do some pupils who have learning disabilities get lost in the data? Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I can say that with, with, without a doubt. And does that then mean that they're not getting the support or we're not planning for the support that they need? Then, then yes. Perhaps it's just about more clarity in the data and more visibility in the data. Um, and the actual analysis, it's not just about the data because it, what it's about is what we do with that and what that does in terms of the planning for the resources, the planning for the support that needs to be in place. Um, so it's, 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 it's more visibility of, of maybe young people who require more support or for, for, from our perspective, young people who have a, a learning disability. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mundell. Thank you, uh, convener. I was going to ask about categorisation, but I think that that that, that uh, solves uh, that question. Um, I was interested in diagnosis uh, and assessments, and whether you felt that they were being used enough um, and were actually available to, to to classroom teachers and to schools. Uh, cause certainly, uh, my own local experience is that people are waiting uh, years or uh, being asked to rely solely. Uh, on assessments made by the classroom teacher who maybe when it comes to uh, autism um, or uh, other uh, specialist uh, learning difficulties doesn't doesn't necessarily have uh, the, the sort of expertise um, and also can't give uh, can't give a diagnosis that that, that sort of I, I, I don't know how to put it sort of um, I, I guess it isn't sort of respected by other professionals. Um, or, is dis or is dismissed by a local authority. Okay. <laughs> um, I would say, um, Mr Mundell, that you are completely right about diagnosis being an issue that needs to be discussed and addressed. Um, I think that, again, and I suppose it's almost like the theme of this, of this session, is about inconsistency. And again, and again, there is massive variation in inconsistency in different local authorities and different health boards to um, both the diagnosis pathway, but also how long that pathway takes and what can happen. And I think just as um, Mr. Scott said before, um, getting an early diagnosis can be incredibly powerful and incredibly life-changing, both for a young person and for their family to access support. At the moment, from what we hear, um, there are some places where you can get a diagnosis actually relatively quickly if you're in a school, and there are some places, potentially, like your constituency, where it can be an absolutely ridiculous process to have to go through, and it's the first fight that a parent has to undertake. Um, and I think, like we said before, they shouldn't be having to have any fights, um, so it's not fair. I start, yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, probably to, to some of the earlier points as well, actually, the, the diagnosis of a learning disability you would expect would happen, or you would hope would happen before you reach a school. Um, but for many parents, it, it, it does not. Um, but that was maybe to the point that was made earlier about um, early years. Um, certainly, we, we published some research in 2014 um, on um, early years and the journey to a diagnosis of a learning disability. And, and that, was, that was absolutely our finding that it is a struggle, um, that it's, it can take years. Um, and what happens is that you're not getting access to the supports and services that, that, that you need in the meantime. Um, but ideally, if, if 
if diagnosis was was made before school, then actually you'd be planning for the support that, that is 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 needed for, the, for that young person in the school environment as well. Uh, I'm just going to add to that. Uh, it would be lovely for teachers to arrive into school uh, and be told all the background information about a youngster and all the, the plans that are in place and all the support the teacher is going to get. I don't mean just on that day, in, in, the, in the months beforehand, so teachers are ready and able to address those things. We're far from that stage. Uh, and it's often teachers are having to go back and say, should this, who is this youngster? What support should they have? And then you suddenly find, oh, this is in a process somewhere. Uh, if, it, if, if the process has even started. So, so it'd be nice to get to the situation where teachers are able to deal from day one with the youngster coming in with all, and all the preparation and all the background and all the information available. And do you feel it's uh, or appropriate or fair uh, to, to place the burden on classroom teachers to, to give parents a sort of informal diagnosis of uh, th things like autism uh, or, or other specific learning difficulties or I think you see that the, the, the relationship with a, a secondary school teacher would be that if they felt there was something they, their internal structures they would need to go through and, and an appropriate person would be the person who's got oversight of that to be in contact with the parents but again it's the ability to know what they're actually that identifying a need is not necessarily the same as diagnosing what that need is and I think that's a, a major shift between the two so uh, but I think that it's appropriate that information is, is you know a dialogue with the parents takes place uh, and because it'd be very wrong of a teacher to say that your youngster's got this and that when it's actually not the case at all so, um, so you, yeah. you, you, you think if, if teachers have been asked to do that at the moment that's wrong that's wrong and they've yeah. been asked by local authorities to do that as well mm. for, for, mm. for they won't be able purposes. to they won't be able to yeah mr ward a diagnosis of autism is a clinical activity it's a clinical special activity that must be undertaken we would probably say by doctors it is completely inappropriate for teachers to diagnose well they they can't it would it was ridiculous it was completely inappropriate for teachers to diagnose autism it's not inappropriate for a teacher to say to a parent you know i've noticed some traits and do you have a diagnosis maybe you should talk to your gp that's not inappropriate <coughs> that's good teaching that's that's having an awareness of the child and having a good relationship with the family and i think that's that's good but as shima says for a teacher to turn around and say your kid's autistic it's, it's not it's not okay Okay, no, thank, thank you for that. I mean, obviously, it's more challenging for teachers when there are young people who've been waiting three years within the school system to see a CDAT uh, team. Uh, and I, th I think, you know, I absolutely, I absolutely take, the, take the message, and I think it's wrong people are having to, to wait at all. Um, I was going to ask on the, the point around uh, parents uh, taking their children out of school, uh, do, you, do you think that local authorities are actually encouraging families to do that? Um, I've certainly come across cases where uh, I, I think they allow standoffs to go on so long with families and make the process so frustrating uh, and difficult that, that, it, that it almost goes as far as to, to, to encourage parents that that, that would be the, the best option. Um, I, I probably wouldn't be in a position to say that was, that was the, an approach that local authorities were taking, but I would say anecdotal evidence from parents is that they, they are left feeling like that is the only option for them. So you, I guess you can infer from that that there is, there is something going wrong in, in the system and the dialogue that is, it is reaching that point where parents feel that is the only option for them. They're not making it through a, a proactive choice. They are feeling that that, is, that was the only available route for them. And if you think about it, you know, this is a weird way to think about having a child, but it's kind of a ticking clock. So, you know, you have a child and there's only so many years of formal education that child is, has access to. And if you're appearing in a dispute with a local authority and that clock is ticking and you're thinking, right now, nothing's happening, they're stuck in limbo, then, you know, there is an incentive for you to make a call that maybe isn't the right call and to say, well, actually, then we will just homeschool them or we'll find somewhere else. And, you know, th there's something... Again, I don't have any data, and I wouldn't want to say that local authorities were doing this deliberately because I don't have no evidence of that. But there is something about the speed of the of the resolution of conflict that there's a lot of it, ones that have went on for a long time that I think by the length of the dispute means that parents have to make difficult calls. Okay, no, thank you. And then uh, on parents as well, do you think we do enough uh, to involve parents where we're, we're 
how young people are in the mainstream setting. We certainly heard uh, a focus group uh, that we had as part of the Education Committee uh, that, that a lot of parents found it maybe difficult um, and things had to go wrong before uh, b b before they were sort of invited into the school to help and often they felt that they were the sort of expert when it came to uh, their children and, and helping sort of put them in, in, in a sort of place or, or, or manage their behaviour such that they could actually be part of the classroom setting. Do you think uh, is, do you think schools do enough at the moment to to involve parents at the earliest stage? Some do, some don't. I, I think is the is the truth. There are some examples of you know. Ultimately, I think this isn't just for additional sport needs pupils. Partnership with parents is is vital all, at all steps. And you know, for any any child making their way through school, having a good relationship with that parent is really really key. And I think for a, a child with additional support needs, it's especially important. Um, I think there are some schools where those relationships are, are really well constructed, where people have a lot of faith and trust, and there are probably some where people do not, are not treated as a partner, but are treated as a nuisance or a pain, or they're on the phone again. And to be honest, they should be on the phone, because as we've discussed, that seems to be the only way to get anything done, and that's not right. I think just to, to add a, a kind of secondary point onto that as well, it's also about um, how schools can support parents with their child's learning at home, because that, that there's, there's plenty of research out there around actually how do we support the continuous learning and learning in the home environment as well, homework or just continuous learning. Um, and actually sometimes schools have discovered and, and found really good ways of, of working with a young person, the learning strategies that work. And it's actually about how do we support the parents of that young person as well to continue that, that and reinforce that good work, those good strategies at home as well as what, what's happening in the classroom. So it's, it's, a, it's a really crucial relationship um, and, and it does work well in some places. and, and to next point, it, it doesn't in others, and there is a, a case of relationship breakdown in, for a lot of families in terms of that kind of battle that, that, that they're fighting. Sure. And uh, finally, uh, can I just ask uh, Mr Ward, uh, in terms of the not included, not engaged, not involved report, I understand uh, you and the other organisations you represent have been in sort of continued dialogue with the government. Is there any update on that and what of the key asks from the report of the Scottish Government and Cabinet Secretary committed to? Sure. Okay, um, there, there is an update, there is an update. So we, we, we wrote the report and it had nine asks and we uh, met with the Cabinet Secretary and um, he was very nice, very warm, he took the issue very seriously. Um, he agreed that to commission a round table which we had last week around the issue of initial teacher education. And, um, and to get sort of all, all of the big players um, along and invited. So the GTCS was there, was there the EIS was there, uh, the Scottish Council of Deans of Education, COSLA was there. Um, and this was to sort of explore the issue of could we be doing more in initial teacher education for autism. And it was a very interesting discussion because it sort of started out of saying, well, you know, the sort of the classic argument of, you know, if we're going to do it for autism, like what about everything else and how, how do you fit it in? But actually, for the discussion we had at the round table, we got to a place that we accepted that actually because of a number of different issues, because of the prevalence of autism, because of the seriousness of incidents that happen, and also because of the, autism is actually a little bit different than other additional support needs. It's part of an identity. It's a, it's a holistic condition about who you are and how your brain functions. Um, that potentially there was some work to do. So what he's agreed to do is um, he's formed a working group with us and the Scottish Council of Deans of Education to explore the issue. And that's really, really positive. And to be honest, the, the best bit that I heard from them was that the representative from the Scottish Deans of Education accepted a couple of things that we've actually talked about here. So he accepted, for example, there could be potentially greater standardization of what um, initial teacher education and autism looks like and that we could maybe work on figuring out what that baseline could be um, because Education Scotland were saying part of the problem that they have is that when you've got teachers who have all got vastly different experiences come to them actually it's not clear um, so that's really positive I suppose and we're really really grateful for that I suppose the um, the downside is that the other main calls that we called for um, haven't been answered. So we asked, um, we sent a letter and 
we, we didn't get what I would consider to be an adequate response. I would say it felt a bit copy and pasted in terms of response to the calls that we made, and that was disappointing. And this letter was signed by 3,000 of our supporters, and um, the, the issues that weren't addressed. So we feel that we're having the issue of, of teacher training for, about autism addressed, and we were really happy with that. We haven't had addressed the issue about stopping these unlawful exclusions. There's been no process at, progress in it. There's been no acceptance that the ability to do so rests with government. Um, and we've asked for them to be formally recorded so at least we have an idea of the data and we have an idea of how, me, how much it is happening. Again, that has not been agreed to yet, which is a shame, but we'll continue to engage with the government on it. And then the other one that hasn't been agreed with yet either is something that we talked on here, which is approve, improve the numbers and availability of specialist teachers in the education system. Um, that was the answer we got where we just, the, the overall number of teachers has increased, uh, which again, it's great, we love it, but we'd like more information about specialist teachers. And would we like to work with the government constructively on what does that mean to be a specialist teacher and how, and how can we make sure that we've got a, a gold quality standard so that actually no matter what school that your child goes to, you know that that additional support in this teacher has a certain level of expertise to support your child well. Um, so we've made progress, we're pleased with the progress we've made and we thank the government for that, but I think there's still a lot to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms Mackay? Yes, thanks. You know, um, just picking up on a lot of the things that have been said, do you think the policy would work better if there was a sort of standardised, more of a standardised framework across local authority areas in regard to data, definition of ASA and the use of CSPs, really everything we've been talking about? Do you think it's too piecemeal? Um, I'd just like your opinion on that. We, that's what we need uh, and that's what teachers need uh, so uh, what, what you're suggesting is exactly what we do we need to move forward and, and I, we would support that okay thank you anyone else we would also I, I think so many of the issues that have been raised today come from this this issue of you know inconsistency across different borders and boundaries and we have to be honest that these are artificial lines drawn in the sand you know and someone living one street down can have a completely different experience and Sadly, what that means is for a lot of times it's a classroom lottery for autistic kids and, yeah. and, and their families from our perspective. So I think we would definitely support a, a greater standardization. Um, and, you know, as Dr. Allen was saying, even the phraseology, you know, we want to offer guidance, but how can we offer guidance when it's called five different things and it means five different things um, in different places? It's, it's really tough and I think it would make a big difference. Mm -hmm. Kayleigh? Yeah, just to, to say that, uh, that we would also agree in terms of there being pockets of really great practice and actually how do we make that universal. Um, and I think when we're talking about resources, when we're when each area is having to create and reinvent the wheel and, and create their own version of things, actually that has a, a resource implication. And actually if we could provide something that was a baseline element of kind of standardisation, then then absolutely that would that would free up resources for other things. Thank you. Thank you. I think that concludes questions from the committee. So can I just thank all the panel members uh, for the time this morning. It's been a very helpful, very interesting um, exchange with the committee. And um, I'm going to move into private session uh, and close to the public.